Hello, my name is Dr. Linda Waldman. Welcome to this lecture on theorizing knowledge and gender in M Health. This lecture is split into three parts. Part one is called Contextualizing Knowledge. Part two, Translating Knowledge for Improved Health. And part three, M Health and Situated Knowledge. This is part one, Contextualizing Knowledge. We live in a global economy. This means that knowledge is an increasingly important, indeed, some might say vital, component of the global economy and something which determines the wealth of different nations. This in turn means that access to knowledge and the ability to determine how it is used is something individuals and countries compete over. The World Bank has suggested that knowledge might be the most powerful driver of economic progress. This also suggests that knowledge is critical to development and to the achievement of positive change in society. Knowledge, however, differs from information. Information may be understood as data or sensory inputs, while knowledge refers to people's ability to make sense of and use information. Turning information into knowledge involves validating information. Is it real or true? Prioritizing information. What information is most important? And processes of legitimating information socially. This distinction between knowledge and information and the ways in which we make sense of information is particularly important because, in addition to living in a knowledge economy, in which access to knowledge is linked to wealth, we are experiencing a knowledge explosion. Technology innovation associated with the internet and mobile phones has meant that we are exposed to more and more information, all of which is easy to access. This is part of the promise and the potential of mHealth. It can offer people easy access to health information, which opens up many new possibilities. Terms like the information society, a term which refers to the power embedded in new ICTs or a knowledge economy which uses knowledge and aims to build bridges between global and local institutions and individuals are increasingly used to refer to some of the potential of technology for development. Being provided with lots of information, however, raises questions. Are they different kinds of information? Who uses what information? How is it being used? How do people in different contexts turn information into knowledge that is useful and relevant to their daily lives? The use of mobile phones for health means that people have incredible access to innumerable sources of health information and knowledge. Many digital technologies encourage people to access information about medical and health topics and to share experiences of their conditions and treatment with others. This, it is believed, will result in patients or citizens having better knowledge of their health and health conditions and in improved government efficiency in the delivery of health. The most obvious example of mHealth and health information are SMS or text messages, which disseminate information immediately and at very little cost. Underlying these SMS messages and other forms of health information promotion is the idea that knowledge about what causes ill health and about what choices people have available to them will lead to changes in behaviour and to enhanced health. The idea is that an individual will read the text, make rational decisions and then develop appropriate behaviours which promote his or her health. One can find many examples of this idea that health information and knowledge makes a difference to people's health. For example, Gold and colleagues show that Australian youth were positive about the SMS or text messages which provided information on sexual health issues. The text messages appear to be a feasible, popular and effective method of promoting health information to these young people. However, while communicating information is seen as incredibly beneficial, this does not always lead to healthier behaviours. 
not least because people have other forms of knowledge and opinions about what causes ill health and because economic, social and political factors may constrain behaviour and choices. This local, personal or cultural knowledge is often seen as outdated, as not modern, as quaint, misguided or incorrect when contrasted to medical and scientific knowledge about our bodies. Academics have tended to draw a distinction between scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Scientific or modern knowledge involves trials and experimentation. These become the basis for replication and comparison. This is generally also seen as top-down knowledge, which is held by medical doctors or specialists, and they communicate this knowledge to non-scientific people when necessary. Scientific knowledge has also been described as etic or outsider knowledge, which is codified and abstract knowledge. Scientific knowledge is characterized as always being rational, based on observations, measurements, interpretation and results, and it is seen as being beyond outside influence, or neutral, and often strongly linked to technology. Scientific knowledge is a tool for development, and the idea is frequently that if we can transfer scientific knowledge and excellence from high income countries to low and middle income countries, then they will also benefit. As a consequence, there is a range of experts working in low and middle income countries. People like agricultural extension officers, people in the health system, in NGOs, all of whom draw on science and use science and who form an epistemic community. Scientific or modern knowledge is contrasted with non-modern or indigenous knowledge. I think non-modern is a terrible term because it suggests that this knowledge does not operate in today's world, whereas I would argue that it's very critical for many people and helps them negotiate the knowledge economy. Non-modern knowledge refers to indigenous knowledge, also called traditional, practical, local, eastern, emic or Métis knowledge. It is sometimes even called neo-indigenistic. This knowledge is often implicit embedded, practical, holistic, and may have a cultural or religious dimension. So you can see how it contrasts with scientific knowledge. For many years, this kind of knowledge was seen as a reason for failure to develop. It was because people clung to their indigenous knowledge and failed to embrace modern or scientific approaches that people and countries failed to develop. Development experts started paying attention to this kind of knowledge in the 1950s and 1960s as a result of large-scale development failures. They believed that drawing on this kind of knowledge would enable people's activities to be more sustainable and more democratic. However, in the world of health and health systems research, there is still a tendency to see indigenous knowledge, such as that of informal healers, for example, as problematic. Yet, when we compare scientific and non-modern knowledge, we find that these kinds of knowledge are not as far apart as they might appear at first glance. We know that indigenous knowledge also involves trials, experimentation and validation. The requirements of validation are often similar to peer review and replicability features highly. Yet there is a difference. Scientific trials and experimentation often happen out of time in laboratories over limited periods of time and overlook real life constraints. Whereas indigenous trials are embedded in social context and influenced by everyday experiences and the contingencies of life. Scientific knowledge is judged by notions of excellence, peer review publication and standards of analysis. Indigenous knowledge is often judged by people's ability to cope and keep going. So Paul Richards, who's been doing a huge amount of work on this in relation to farming, argues that indigenous knowledge has a different logic to science and it is better to understand it as social action and performance. Often indigenous and scientific knowledge had the same origins. For example, pharmacology is based on people's knowledge of plants. And for this reason, Agrawal argues that the dichotomy between indigenous technical knowledge and scientific knowledge does not hold up to scrutiny. 
Actually, he says, it is impossible to classify knowledge into either Western or indigenous knowledge because this varies across time and space, because scientific knowledge is itself cultural, and because this distinction does not recognize issues of power in relation to knowledge. Taylor and Standing make a similar argument, suggesting that there is an increasingly complex interrelationship between local and global knowledge. These include clashes around rights to knowledge, such as debates about indigenous knowledge rights versus those of multinational pharmaceuticals. Although we now recognize that this division doesn't hold up very well, and both non-modern or indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge have formed the basis of many different and complex scientific issues, science is still a critical tool for solving health and other development challenges. How then is science related to policy? The conventional understanding is that first, the problem is examined using science to reach an objective view of what the issues are. Then possible options are explored, the costs and benefits of each option are carefully assessed, and then a rational choice is made about which is the best option. The best option is then implemented into policy, and after it's been tried for a while, the outcome is evaluated. The assumption here is that science feeds into policy in a linear way and helps to make informed decisions about development and how to address poverty. The idea is that there is a clearly identifiable problem. A scientific explanation provides an obvious and clear-cut understanding of the problem, as well as a scientific and appropriate solution. But as Shaw and Wright remind us, policies appear rational, effective, and neutral, but are really about choices, values, and political decisions. In practice, the use of science in policy is often incremental, complex, and messy. It is a process of disjointed incrementalism, or what Lindblom calls muddling through. It is iterative, often based on a trial and error process, on learning from mistakes, and then taking corrective measures. Policy is also influenced through competition and bargaining between different actors and interests. Often different people understand the problem, and hence the solution, differently. They bring different kinds of knowledge, and different narratives to bear on the problem. Policy is then the result of a series of interactions and negotiations between a range of actors, all of whom wish for different outcomes, and all of whom are drawing on their networks and practices to encourage policymakers to see the problem as they do and to implement the solution they feel is most desirable. As a result, policy is heavily based on the interaction between different actors and on the negotiation of different kinds of knowledges and narratives. In addition, policy does not always wait for a complete understanding of the problem. It is seldom a finite process with a clear beginning and an end, which always relies on the most recent science for its solutions. Ultimately, using science in policy must be seen as a political process as well as an analytical problem-solving activity. The idea that science and policy is political brings us to feminist critiques of science. These critiques have focused on power relations, pointing out that science is seldom as objective and neutral as its proponents like to think. Rather, it is itself a cultural production in which the problems, theories, methods, and interpretations are influenced by gender. Linked to this lecture is an assignment which will help you explore some of the classic examples of how science has been influenced by factors like gender. A feminist approach, instead of privileging science as a way of knowing, argues that neither science nor indigenous knowledge presents a more accurate definition of reality, but rather that there are multiple and different bodies of knowledge different ways of knowing, and different kinds of knowledge are linked to different values. Harding and Haraway argue that it is not that scientific knowledge is better. It is not about privileging one set of knowledge over others, nor is it about dichotomizing expert and lay knowledges and emphasizing the difference. Rather, they suggest, we have to recognize that all knowledge is partial, 
and all knowledge is situated. And so they talk about situated or embodied knowledge as being a more appropriate way to acknowledge the diverse and power differentiated communities in which knowledge originates. So for feminists, objectivity is created through situated and partial knowledges and it is always multidimensional and political. For them, science is about contestation rather than closure, and it expressly acknowledges agency in relation to knowledge. Solving health challenges through science and knowledge is not straightforward. As Bill Gates has recently acknowledged, when he started his global health research initiative, he thought it could be solved through a combination of science and business acumen. If he had excellent science and the necessary resources, it would be possible to overcome all development and health challenges. After 10 years of trying to do this, he has become more humble. Rather, questions like whose knowledge should count become important. Science is often initiated in and focused on Europe and American challenges rather than those in low and middle income countries. As is evident on this pie chart, showing what health topics and regions scientific publications addressed in 2001. There is a need to emphasize local challenges and find local solutions, rather than hoping one innovation or one technology can solve challenges in many different locations. Gates points out that in funding excellent scientists to work on TB drugs, vaccines and malaria, his team failed to consider what it would take to implement new technologies in contexts where millions of people lack basic necessities. The question, whose knowledge counts, also applies in terms of patients and scientists. In initiatives aimed at maternal and child health, should the focus be on expert scientific knowledge about pregnancies and trimesters and gestational age? Or should it build on women's own understandings of their bodies and the physical changes they are undergoing? Are these knowledges always different? What kinds of information is being provided to women? And how are they using this information? What is being translated into knowledge and what is rejected because it doesn't fit with women's own bodily or other knowledge? Going back to our earlier discussions about M Health and information, when people receive SMS messages containing health information, this tends to be biomedical information. To what degree should other non-scientific information be included? There are also calls to make science more democratic in its approach to solving health and development challenges. This takes many forms, including awareness of social factors that shape how people make decisions, or greater emphasis on experience-based expertise greater participation by non-specialists and community members. Jasanoff refers to this as the co-production of science and society, when technical experts and other groups in society generate new knowledge and technologies together. This is similar to what McCormick calls democratizing science, where official knowledge is opened up to questions of value and morality in order to make it more accountable to affected populations. Finally, to end part one of this lecture, Langdon Winner reminds us that if we focus only on innovation, on gadgets and technology, then we can ignore the critical political dimensions that go with health development challenges. We can pretend it's only better science that is needed to solve these problems. Instead, however, we need to focus carefully on what low and middle income countries might need on how local problems are articulated and experienced by people on the ground, and on how complicated political, economic and social dimensions come together and intersect with technology and with health systems to create challenges and it also, we hope, in where we will find the solutions.